This short video is intended to supplement your materials for study notes part 1, 1 1.1 to 1.2. As this graphic depicts, there are three branches of the state. The first is the judicial branch of government, depicted on your far left. The second is the legislative branch of government, depicted in the middle of the graph. And the third is the executive branch, depicted on the right. This graphic indicates that all three branches of government exercise public power. It shows us that all three branches of government must comply with the requirements of legality, in other words, they must exercise their public powers in a manner that is lawful, they must exercise those powers in good faith, and they must exercise those powers rationally. Now, one type of public power, and the type that administrative law is primarily concerned with, is referred to as administrative action and that is the inner circle inside the graphic. As the inner circle depicts, all three branches of government can perform administrative action. In addition, even natural and juristic persons can perform administrative action when they exercise public power. However, the branch of government primarily responsible for performing administrative action is the executive branch of government and specifically the public administration, the lower level officials responsible for implementing or putting in action legislation. So let's talk a little bit more about what each branch of government does. The judicial branch of government comprising judges, magistrates and judicial officials, is primarily responsible for adjudicating disputes of law and fact by applying law to facts to resolve those disputes. The legislative branch of government comprises parliament, the national legislature and provincial legislatures as well as municipal councils. Now this branch of government is primarily responsible for creating legislation, so making law. The executive branch of government is primarily responsible for formulating policy and putting law into action, so executing law. Now this branch of government is made up of the high executive, the president, his cabinet and uh, MECs of the provinces as well as lower level officials who physically on a day-to-day -day basis put law into action. Now administrative action is typically concerned with those public officials who day-to-day -day put law into action. Those people are performing conduct that is described as administrative action and meets all the elements of administrative action described in the inner circle. In other words, they are usually involved in taking decisions that are administrative in nature, that are public in nature, that are performed in terms of empowering provisions, and when their decisions have adverse impacts on rights and are sufficiently final, and provided those decisions are not covered by any of the specific exclusions listed in PUDGA, then their conduct will be administrative action and will be regulated by the Promotion of Administrative Justice Act, PUDGA. Now, when conduct of the public administration or any other of the branches of government is performed that does not fall within the definition of administrative action, then it is not regulated by PUDGA and instead it is considered public power 
that must be consistent with the requirements of legality. When public power is administrative action and does fall within the definition of administrative action in terms of PUDGER, then it is regulated by PUDGER and must be consistent with the requirements of lawfulness, fairness and reasonableness. If it is not, then the power can be subject to review in terms of PUDGER and a remedy in terms of PUDGER can be granted in response to a failure to comply with the requirements of lawfulness, fairness and reasonableness. Now it should be clear that there's quite an overlap between what is required of all public power and what is required of administrative action more specifically as a type of public power. And because of this overlap, we have to teach you about the requirements of legality and the requirements with which administrative action must comply under PUDGA. Because legality is often being used by our courts to do the work that the administrative law under PUDGA ought to do. But let's think for a moment about the role that administrative law has played and continues to play in order to hold public power to account. Some of the examples we've given you in your study notes to read include the case of Abdurrahman, where the appellate division during the apartheid era held that a decision taken in terms of national legislation authorizing the exclusive use of railway cars for white people only in a passenger train without also reserving cars for other groups was an unlawful exercise of public power in terms of the administrative law. In the apartheid era case of Ricotto, the court held that the practice of the East Rand Administration Board, which made it impossible for black workers to establish permanent residence rights in white areas, conflicted with the purpose for which the board had been granted its powers, and that its conduct was therefore unlawful also in terms of the administrative law. These two cases show that during apartheid, the administrative law played an important role in the struggle for social justice of that era. Post-apartheid, the administrative law has been a useful tool in the ongoing struggle for social justice, as the majority of South Africans do not yet have access to resources to meet their basic needs. So, the administrative law has been invoked successfully to control state decisions about access for impoverished people to basic resources such as social assistance grants, housing, electricity and water. An example of this is the Joseph case where the Constitutional Court held that the termination of the electricity supply of a group of impoverished people living in a block of flats was administrative action that was procedurally unfair and should be set aside. We've asked you to look at a number of cases concerning the role of administrative law in politicking, so in other words, in pursuing a political agenda. Now, in each of these cases, the conduct at issue was found not to be administrative action, so in the case of the Similane decision and in the outer e-tolling decision, the conduct was found not to be administrative action. So what that meant is that it wasn't reviewable or subject to judicial scrutiny in terms of PUDGER. However, the principle of legality applied and some of the standards that would be applicable under the administrative law previously were used 
in relation to an example of public power that did not amount to administrative action so as to hold government accountable, or at least to test government conduct against those standards of accountability. And we've included these examples of public power for you to read and think about because they illustrate that there's an overlap between the requirements of legality and the requirements of administrative law under PUDGA. And they also illustrate that we need to always test whether public power that might be administrative action against the definition of administrative action in PUDGA in order to see whether PUDGA applies and to use PUDGA when it does apply instead of legality. And this is because of what the principle of subsidiarity tells us about invoking a specific norm, in other words the norms in PUDGA, where that specific norm is applicable, rather than having resort to a general norm, in other words the general norm of legality. Subsidiarity tells us that we have to check if the specific norm applies and only use the general norm of legality when the specific norm is found not to apply. And so that is why we've in included the cases of Similane and Alta in your reading, because in those cases, subsidiarity was correctly followed. The conduct was found not to be administrative action and therefore not to fall with the inner circle depicted on this graphic and only thereafter to be tested against the more general standards of legality as conduct that is public power in the bigger circle and not in the inner circle of your graphic. Now importantly, whenever we speak about testing public power, we're always referring to what the courts do when they scrutinize exercises of public power when a dispute is brought to them. So what we're referring to is the process of judicial review where courts examine exercises of public power first to determine whether or not those exercises of public power are or are not administrative action and then to determine whether those exercises of public power comply either with the standards of legality if the conduct is not administrative action or with the standards of PUDGA if the conduct is administrative action. So let's talk a little bit more about judicial review. The process in terms of which public power can be tested in a court for its soundness is known as review. And this is a process in terms of which a court determines whether or not a decision complies with the requirements of either legality or PUDGA, and if it does not comply with those requirements, sets the conduct aside, usually. And the scrutiny of the exercise of public power and the remedy of setting aside is particular to the public law. In administrative law, the remedy of setting aside is provided for in PUDGA, and under constitutional law, the remedy of setting aside is a function of section 172 of the Constitution. But what do courts do when they review a decision? Well, there'll obviously be a dispute between someone who's affected by an exercise of public power and someone who has performed public power, so typically someone in government. Now, when there's a dispute, the person aggrieved by an exercise of public power will go to court to challenge the exercise of that public power. And when they do so, they take a matter on review. And when the court scrutinizes the exercise of public power, 
the court must first determine what type of public power it is scrutinizing and it must do so because that will then influence the standards against which the court tests that public power. And second of all, the court considers the manner in which the decision was taken or the public power was performed rather than looking at whether the decision maker took the correct decision. So a review is something that is distinct from appeal. When courts review decisions, they don't consider the merits of the decision. When courts appeal, are, well rather are exercising an appeal function, they determine whether a decision was right or wrong. They look at the merits of the decision. And this course is really all about situations where courts have reviewed conduct that is public power and have tested that conduct against the requirements of legality or against the requirements of PAJA. So just about every case we look at in this course concerns an exercise of public power and then concerns the court considering whether or not it can scrutinize that exercise of public power and if so against what standards. Of course there are other ways in which, court, in which public power may be held accountable. Courts are not the only way in which public power may be held accountable. And this is really evident at the moment in all the protest action that's happening all around our country, both at universities and in relation to recent decisions of parliament. So protest action is another way in which public power is held to account. There are also the Chapter 9 institutions, such as the Public Protector, and there are ways of holding public power accountable internal to the public power itself. So by pursuing some kind of internal review or appeal within a public body rather than proceeding straight to court. But we as lawyers are primarily concerned with how you would take public power to court to challenge decisions or defend decisions in court.